Welcome to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Listen and grow as Dell questions the status quo, encourages you to think differently, and empowers you to make a better life. Get ready as Dell challenges core beliefs, seeks the truth, and reveals the roadmap to the lifestyle you really want. And now your host, multi-millionaire, national award-winning investor, CEO and founder of Lifestyles Unlimited, Del Wamsley. Welcome to the Del Wamsley Radio Show, where the hype ends and the help begins. I'm your host, Del Wamsley, and as always, I'm working on your financial freedom. Today, my friends, I'm going to go into, uh, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five of uh, the biggest mistakes you can make in trying to invest for retirement. I'm going to cover that, though, but first I want to uh, do a monologue here, basically, of something that I ran into this weekend. This weekend I went out and visited some people I'd never met before. I'd been in contact with them before because they were they have a hobby group that I was interested in. And I won't tell you what the hobby was or who they were or anything like that because I don't want to bring any attention to them, uh, either positively or negatively, without their permission. But the bottom line is is that I went to this this hobby meeting and it was at somebody's house and everybody was nice, and, you know, felt comfortable, got right into conversation with everybody. And then after, you know, went through some, you know, interesting conversation about the hobby with the people and what they're doing and, you know, so on and so forth. Then I went to their meeting and they, they had a meeting and I was just a guest. I wasn't a part of their group, uh, but they let me sit in. And it was interesting as they read the minutes and the the role, the roster of people that were there and the budget and so on and so forth, just to, to watch it all, how they were running this little club that had at the meeting, I'm going to say 15, 20 people. I didn't bother to count, but it looked like around that many uh, at the meeting. And they were running it like parliamentary procedure kind of meeting that you might run at a condo board. You know, where there's six, eight, 10, 20 people there, that type of a thing. They had voted in people. You know, there were different people had different jobs and responsibilities. And as I sat there, I, I, I was just amazed. And I don't know how to say this, really, because they seem like really nice guys. I know this. They're all very, very smart. Um, speaking with them, they've all, they all have good jobs. They're successful. These are not, you know, idiots by any means. They, in fact, that's way, way too far off. They're, they're just regular people that have good jobs, that have a hobby together. They all have the same kind of hobby. And that has nothing to do with what the hobby is or what they are or who they are. Other than this is that when I listen to the whole thing, and by the way, this is a kind of hobby. It's like the apartment association. There's local chapters, and then there's regional chapters, and then there's a national chapter of these guys. And in the national apartment association, the way it works is there's a city group, you know, like the Houston Apartment Association. Then there's the Texas Apartment Association, and then there's the National Apartment Association. And so, as I sat there, I saw that, okay, their total budget was the annual budget of the entire club, the local club, and I don't know what the, the, the regional club or the national club was, but of the local club for the whole year, was literally less than what I think any guy there made in a month. That's the total budget. And to that budget... There were the things they wanted to do, the events that they threw to display their hobby to the outer world, you know, let people know what it is they do, show off what they do, meet with other people. It's like, you know, my expo where people come and meet and you can network and also you can meet people to try to teach you something and or buy stuff there, whatever type of a deal. But it's really like their kind of expo. What I call my expo is, is their, their meeting or their uh, little events. And the first thing I heard when I walked in the door, the guy, nice guy, was just telling me out of nowhere. I don't know why he even started telling me this, but, you know, hey, 
I don't know if we have enough money to be able to make this first event. And I guess he was just kind of asking people, hey, would you donate or something is what he might have been doing. I'm not even sure because he didn't come right out and ask for the donation, which I might have done. But I was just amazed, just, you know, first time there. just wanted to not overstep my bounds and see what was going on. But he was talking about how, you know, look, the the venues have gone up now. Um, The venues all by the time we buy the venue and we get the police and you have to have a police for every venue you you rent nowadays uh it, it's going to cost like a thousand bucks and i had to gasp and not say anything and think that my gosh we go out to dinner and spend that much not me and my wife but you know we take a couple friends or whatever we'll spend a thousand bucks on you know two or three families dinner and i'm thinking okay I'm sitting in the meeting and they're talking about, okay, there's, you know, let's say there's 15, 20 people here at this meeting, but they rent the rent or the, the uh, membership role. And they said there was like 115 people and it was down like 10 people from last year. COVID had knocked a bunch of people out. They just, and, you know, obviously any hobby, there is people to come and go and lose interest all the time. So that's nothing to do with them. But, you know, COVID made it even worse. And so they were kind of floundering from that event also. But, Let's say there's over 100 people in this chapter of whatever it is, and uh, they have a hard time raising a 1000 bucks for this event. And then the event is supposed to produce 5000 bucks type of a deal. And then they pay all their money out of the out of the event, and it comes down to, you know, maybe 2000 profit. I don't know, 2500 at best. And that's their budget for the year kind of a thing just blows my mind. I mean, any any one of them makes that much in a month, maybe even more. Uh, my God, exactly more. They might make that much in a week. And he said, well, Del, well, what do you care? Well, I don't care. I'm trying to make a point here. I'm going to get to the point somehow. And that is, if you see 15, 20 people, and remember, there's 100 people in the group, so that there's interest in whatever they're doing. And if you see 15, 20 of them are getting together and then they're talking, okay, we're going to go over here, we're going to do this, and we need to get together and and produce this so we can do the event. And they're all busy. Well, I don't have because that's two weekends this month and that's more than I can give. And I can volunteer this week and I can volunteer this week and I volunteer this day and I volunteer this day. And all this, and I'm thinking, all of that, all of that volunteerism and stuff has to either be fun and, you know, getting together with other guys, doing that hobby, which you like to do, is probably fun. Okay? So, knock on wood, I'm assuming it is. That the whole event, the whole thing of it, doesn't seem to get very far. In fact, the event was supposed to show product from what they do, the kinds of things that they collect, their collectors, and so on and so forth. And... It was it was a dismal display of that. And what I'm saying is, is that it reminds me about something that I learned a long, long time ago, and that is thinking small in life gets you small. The old saying, if you shoot for a mountain, you'll hit the dirt. If you shoot for the stars, you could hit a mountain. And I just saw a bunch of guys sitting there, and I think there was a a woman or two, sitting there shooting for the dirt and hitting it is what I basically saw. Now, let's leave them alone for a second because it's really not what, that's just started me thinking about this. What it started me thinking about was about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, one of my staff came to me and said, hey, there's this real estate investing expo up in Dallas. This guy that we knew, I knew who he was, was putting it on. He did it every year. That was his thing. And he made money from it, and he collected leads from it, from people. Got to know people that he could sell stuff to, product, could invest with in real estate and so forth. So it had benefits to him to do it. And uh, they brought it to me and said, hey, do you want to get involved in this? And I'm going to share with you why I elected not to get involved with that and what I did instead. Today I'm talking about the reality that most people think small and that if you're ever going to be successful in life, you have to learn to think large. That simple.
the example I'm using is that this weekend I, I went to someone's event, and it was a very small event, and by the way it was being handled, the way the nature of the way the whole system that they had was being organized, it was never going to get anything more than small and inconsequential, and inconsequential in the not that they don't think it's inconsequential, but from anybody from looking from the outside in would say, man, there's really nothing there. And why is that important? Well, for them, it probably wasn't important at all. They probably would hear what I'm saying right now and go, oh, that's ridiculous. I mean, we've, you know, we know exactly what we're doing. We're whatever. Uh, but I bet half of them would go, yeah, you're right. I don't know why we do this. So why do we spend all of our time, hours and hours and hours and hours, donating our time to this club for what? What does it end up producing for us? What do we get out of it other than hanging out with a bunch of guys that are interested in the same topics we're interested in, right? So they came to me. I was telling the story about how 10, 15, 20 years ago, I don't remember, I guess maybe 10 or 15 years ago, someone came to me the idea with, hey, Let's go sign up for this guy's expo up in Dallas, and uh, we're in Houston. My main office was. That's where I was at. And I said, well, what is that? He said, well, it's a thing where they bring all these vendors in, and you can buy things from the vendors, get to know the members, and build your vendor list. And there's speakers there that will talk on different topics. And uh, we can be one of the speakers and talk on one of the topics. And I said, why would we want to go to their expo and talk on a topic when we actually control the entire industry and every topic other than, well, that's not true, of the topics that we're into, we dominate them totally. And they said, well, it's just a good place you know, to get to meet some people. And I said, well, how many people will attend? He said, well, actually, they had 600, and they're, like, excited about that. Folks, when I do a case study, when I like, – just a week ago or two, I, I did a, a live event, which was just a free event, open event. And uh, we had fire marshal limited filled room of over 300 people. Couldn't go anymore. RSVP had to shut it down. And we had thousands of people over the Internet. I don't know exactly how many it was. It was over 1,000. I know that. It's probably under 2,000. They were on the Internet watching the thing live because we have cameras, a uh, whole TV studio, radio studio, and so forth in our office so that people can see it all over the country in all 50 states. And um, so it was live, you know, to those places through this TV feed. And the point I'm making there is when a guy tells me, hey, you can get you go to the expo and see 600 people, I go, that's, that's nothing. So I said, you know what? If they can attract the 600 people, and I can attract three, three to 500 people myself, if I just say, hey, come meet Dell and 500 people show up, there's no need for us to go to their event with 600 people. In fact, if I say Dell's going to be there, if they say Dell's going to be there, their event might go from 600 to two or 3,000. And I said, and why would we do that for their event when we could do that for our own event and be able to control the message that gets out about what we do. In other words, not let all the bad messages that come out and the missed messages that come out of real estate investors, something for nothing instantaneously, gratificationally diseased minds, and just teach the stuff that really works and keep it clean and make sure there was a continuity to the whole thing. And they said, okay, well, we can do that. I said, okay, well, here's a couple of things. Number one, we got to be very visible. This has got to be big. I don't want to do something that's small. I mean, we do something that's small, all of a thousand people a visit two or three times a month. You know, at least two or two or three times a month, we're doing something 500 people, you know, strong type deal. I don't want to do this unless it's big. Secondly, it's got to be fun. It's got to be something people are going to want to come to. Uh, it's got to be entertaining. It can't just be okay. And I, I've been to the event that these other guys throw, and it's just a bunch of people walking around in circles. There's nothing really exciting going. They have a raffle. <laughs> people like one or two or three people win something, but I mean, there's nothing going on. There's no, nobody's in control and charged and psyched up and got things happening and bringing people's attention to things or whatever. It just, it's not fun. Um, the next thing is it has to be real. People have to be able to walk away and see that what we're doing is real by meeting real people that do this. 
I know when I went to their event, and I'm just using their event as an example, um, there was nobody introducing anybody. I mean, you could walk around from table to table and talk to the guys selling stuff, but these were just curmudgeons selling stuff. They weren't really anybody that were experts in the field of anything. And so, you know, I would like to go and see experts talk about things that, you know, are important and, and what's happening in the industry and where, where what is the latest and greatest and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And there was none of that when I went there. But, man, our place has to have all that. We have to have that. And we have to have meet and greets. We have to have a place for our members who are all over the country and get together and meet and there be some organized networking. That's another thing I didn't see. There was any organized networking. Like with us, we have uh, one point where we've put out these tables where there's cities. And people go, you want to meet the people in that city? Go over there to that table and meet all those people in that city. There they are, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have leads meeting passives. They have had, leads have their own to a whole other room. We have a deal where the, the passives can get to the leads and meet the leads. So that networking, massive networking. Done. In other words, it's real. It's actually benefiting some people, doing some good. And that was important. And last but not least, it's got to be inspirational. Now, I don't like motivational. I don't like people yelling at me, telling me I got to do better, that I've got to work harder, that I could be a better person if I wanted to. I could be smarter. I could be richer. I could be better with my wife. I don't want to hear all that stuff. I want to be inspired. I want to see somebody go, man, I'd really like to be that person, or I'd really like that person's things or thing or whatever. I want to... I want to be inspired. I want to want to go after something. I don't want somebody to push me towards something. I want to go after them. And I said, we have to have some inspiration there. We've got to bring some people on that are such incredibly neat people that they're going to inspire people to get something done. And that's really what I sought for in the expo. And now, X number of years later, 5,000 people. The event is on every year. It just gets bigger and larger every year, and better and better and better. And that, my friends, is the power of thinking big over the power of thinking small. The Roadmap to Creating the Lifestyle You Really Want. Keep listening. The Del Wamsley Radio Show returns in moments. Successful Lifestyles Unlimited member retires in 10 months. The hardest part for me was to drop off my son, go to a job that I absolutely hated for five years, but know that that was a sacrifice that I needed to make, and then only be able to get to spend two hours with him after school before he had to go back to bed. So that's why once we started and we joined Lifestyles, we said, okay, we have a roadmap. We know what we're gonna do. And then a month later, we find out we're pregnant with baby number two, and we're like, okay, we gotta kick it up a notch. So that's how we were able to purchase four different properties and um, replace in 10 months, replace my income in 10 months so that whenever I finished maternity leave, I didn't have to go back to work. I think a, I think a couple weeks before she baby came out is when we closed on a fourplex and that was enough for her not to have to go back to work. Are you ready for your roadmap to real estate retirement? Attend the online free workshop just like Carolina did. Register at lifestylesunlimitedworkshop.com. Welcome back to the Del Radio Show. Today, uh, we're going to get into the five bad ideas when it comes to investing for retirement. And I've got like a, uh, a mastermind meeting coming up at my house here in October. To attend, you're going to have to be a member and RSVP and the whole bit. Um, so I'm not offering that up to you here on the radio, but... What I want you to understand is this is where we're going to talk about all of the very, very, very high end ideas and topics that are in this industry 
with some of the smartest people in this industry across the nation. Uh, the National Apartment Association puts out an IRO independent owner award each year for the person or persons that own the, you know, independently own an apartment complex. That's actually the best operated, managed, uh, most successful property there is. However, they have a whole bunch of criteria that they use whether it's doing all the right things for society and for the neighborhood and for the finances and for the people that own it. And, you know, there's all kinds of people that are involved in an apartment complex. You've got, you, you, you got your tenants, you know, which, you know, they're stakeholders because they live there. You got your employees because they're stakeholders because they work there. You've got your, uh, investors or stakeholders because they are, they've got their money invested in the deal. Uh, and you've got the neighborhood, which is, you know, a stakeholder because whatever you put into that apartment complex is going to filter out into the neighborhood. Well, we have got people that have won that award every single year for the last 15 years in a row. And I think it might be 16 now. We won it again. Years in a row. So in other words, there's 44,000 independent owners in the National Apartment Association and for 16 years in a, row, in a row, one of the Lifestyles members has come up as the winner. So you can see that our system is highly evolved and very successful. This mastermind is for those people to figure out where do you go next? How do you get ahead? What I'm going to talk to you today about is the uh, complete other end of the spectrum. What are the lowest and most common mistakes made by the average person out there when it comes to building wealth and specifically retirement. Everybody you know, 90%, 95%, maybe even 99% of the people you know, I'll make it 99% if they don't come to Lifestyles Unlimited. If you're not talking to a Lifestyles member, 99% of the non-Lifestyles members you talk to, get it wrong. Absolutely get it wrong in every one of these five topics. So I hope you'll pay attention. The number one worst idea out there, bad idea, is 401ks and IRAs. To tell that's ridiculous. That's what everybody says is the thing to do. Now it's absolutely the worst thing you can do. So why? Well, let's first have to understand what retirement is. Retirement is when you replace your earned income. Now, a lot of people believe that retirement is a pile of money you live off of, but that won't last. That money will be gone, and your goal then will be to die before that pile goes away. That's not what retire. Real retirement is where you've replaced it because you had a pension or because you've got some stream of income coming in that lasts forever. That's real retirement, right? Now, to do that, you have to have cash flow. I ask you, why do you get up and go to work every day? What a redundant painful thing to have to do every day. Get up, get dressed, get in the car, drive through the heavy traffic, go to work, put up with a boss, um, come home, drive through the traffic again, and get up and do it all over again. Why would anybody go through that for an entire life from age 20 to age 65, 75 years of age? Because they have to, because they need cash flow. So the first thing you have to understand is that what we need to retire is regular reoccurring, realized income. Let's go over each of those words for a second. Regular income means it happens on a regular basis. I know I'm getting paid every week or I'm getting paid every two weeks or I'm getting paid every month, but I know when I'm getting paid. It's on a regular basis so I can budget my cost of living. Number two, it's got to be reoccurring. Doesn't matter if I have income and I know when it's coming, but it doesn't come every month or every week, or every two weeks, or whenever it's supposed to come. Just every once in a while, I get some income. That won't work. It's got to be reoccurring. And last, and this is where the IRA and the 401k come into, it has to be realized. What good is it for somebody to go, Hi, Dell, I got your piece of paper out, buddy. Let me write down another 5 or 10 or $100 or $200 or whatever number onto this piece of paper. Yeah, I've given you, you now have more money. See, but I don't have any more money. The piece of paper has a larger number, but I don't have any more money. No, no, Adele, that's that's your money in there. That that number represents. It doesn't represent squat. 
There is that money is doing you absolutely no good whatsoever. I just bought another another commercial building. It's paying me eight thousand dollars a month. I just added eight thousand dollars a month. It doesn't go into an IRA or a four hundred one k or any other kind of thing where some some day some way somehow somewhere I might see it. It's just eight thousand more. Now I already make a ton of money. So another eight thousand, you'll tell why do you even do it? Well, because it's just eight thousand more. Every time I buy another one, I think, wow, I'm going to really expand all the fun things I do. And I never can expand it fast enough. But I do it anyway because the money builds return. You put your money in a 401k, do you get any return? No. How much did your 401k pay you this year? Nothing. Last year, nothing. Year before that, nothing. In fact, you pay it. It's even worse than that. Can you imagine if I said, here's what I want you to do for a real estate deal. I want you to buy a rent house and not rent it. Now, you say, well, why would I do that? Well, same reason you buy a 401k. You put money in the 401k, and every month you pay payments on it. You put money in a rent house to buy it, and every month you pay payments on it, which is your contribution, right? Say, well, then my boss contributes back to that. Say, okay, that's fine. Your rent house, uh, even though it's not rented, is contributing equity back to that, and you say, someday my 401k will be large piece of money. You say, okay, someday their house will be worth a lot. Houses, when I first started buying them, were $25,000. The same houses now are worth three or $400,000. So there's my IRA. Every one of my houses was a 401k. Can you imagine that? But the difference was my 401k, a la rent house, paid me rent every month for the entire 35 years I was a real estate investor. Your 401k paid you squat, and you know it. So now people ask me, and this is what turns this on. I got an email the other day. A lady asked me, uh, should I take my money out of my 401k and put it in a self-directed IRA? No. That's exactly the same thing. You put money in your IRA, and now your IRA makes some money. Even if you buy real estate inside your IRA, it does a bunch of really negative things. Number one, it turns what would be investment rental income, which is done correctly, tax avoidable, uh, and turns it into ordinary income. Immediately, because it's in your IRA, you have to pay taxes on it by the time you take it. It's going to be in a higher tax bracket you're going to take it out of, right? And I explained that one in a long, drawn-out explanation. Just take my word for it. You're going to pay more by putting it in there. And um, you lose all the depreciation benefits. Just the whole deal. The whole deal is wrong. It's upside down and backwards, right? So you don't want a 401k. You don't want an IRA. So let's talk about why. Let's start out when you're a kid. You need to put this money away. No. Why do I need to put the money away? Because someday you're going to need to retire. When you retire, you can pull it back out. So why would I want to do that? If I put it in, it's subject to penalty until I'm 59 and a half. Why would I make it where I have to pay an additional 10% to get to the money I've already earned? That's stupid. Well, because, you know, you need that money. They want to lock it in there so you won't take it. That's what the penalty is for, to keep you from doing the wrong thing. So what you're saying is I'm not going to retire until I'm at least 59 and a half. That's the first assumption of a 401K, right? All right. Well, what's the next assumption? The next assumption is when you pull it out, You'll be in a lower income tax bracket. The only way you'd be in a lower income tax bracket is if you make less than what you make. So you're 20-year-old, 25-year-old, 30-year-old, 35-year-old kid, and you're telling me that when you retire, you're going to be making less? You're going to take out less money than you make as a kid? Are you insane? It is assuming that you're going to be broke when you take the money out. Now, that's a dumb assumption because most people, by the time they retire, are in the highest earned income bracket of their life. And so when you start taking it out that way, it's going to be paying higher taxes. Secondly, even if you take it out a little bit at a time, that means you have to live in poverty. Today, I'm doing the five worst ideas for investing towards retirement. And it looks like I'm not going to be able to get to all five of them since uh, I seem to have a lot more to say about the first one and even get out of it. But let's finish the first one, which is bad ideas, 401ks, IRAs, and especially self-directed IRAs, and trying to invest real estate into self-directed IRAs. It doesn't work, okay? So let's talk about this. One of the things you need to worry about when we talk about self-directed IRA is that your IRA can lend money. It can lend money to anybody except two people, you and your family. So 
when you put money in a 401k or an IRA, somebody's making money with that money. Money not just sitting there. Somebody's owning that. Like I'm, I went and borrowed it away from the bank or I went and got it from, you know, wherever it is you stuck it. And now I'm getting rich with your money. But you sitting here at my seminar want to get rich. But you can't because you don't have any money. You say, well, I have money in a 401k, but that's not your money. How do you know it's not my money? It's not your money because you can't go get it. Go get it. And they won't let you have it. It's not your money. And you can't invest it in what we do. And even if you did, the returns wouldn't go back to you. They'd go back to the IRA and the 401k, which, again, is not your money. It's not your money till you pull it out and pay taxes on it, right? So it, it, you're just you're living a lie. Now, the next thing you have to understand is that even if you can use a self-directed IRA to buy into a syndication or buy into something else, all of that money goes back into the 401k or the IRA. It does not go to you. Again, you don't get any money and you can't retire. And last, and this is one that 90% of the syndicators don't even know about. I bet even many CPAs don't even understand it. But there's a thing out there called UBIT tax. And... Heaven forbids somebody doesn't get caught by this, but the bottom line is we've had people that didn't know about this get caught by it before. I've seen people do it. And that is when you take IRA money into your deals, you got to report to the, the, to the uh, U.S. IRS or whatever how much money's in there and how much money that IRA made. So that IRA almost basically has to file a tax return type deal. And that's a little uh, overstated exactly how all that works. But the bottom line is there is a liability there. And the liability is something called UBIT tax. In other words, when you go to invest your money, your money is allowed to make money and the returns go into your IRA untaxable. But if you use the money in a business where there's leverage and leverage is some portion of the gain, well, in our real estate deals, we put down 20% and we borrow 80%, 80% of the profit is due to leverage then 80% of whatever it is you earn on your IRA profit that year has got to be taxed. It's taxable as you bid income. And you're taking money that you, first of all, don't even get any money from, put it in a deal that you thought would avoid taxes, and then you're putting it back into a deal that's going to make it taxable. And then during all that income that you could have earned with the real estate that would have been tax deferred for either a very long time or forever if you did it the right way, you're now pulling it out and paying ordinary income taxes on it when even the regular income taxes on it would have been less. So, my friends, it's just a very, very bad idea to get into 401ks and self-directed IRAs. Most people that join Lifestyles after some period of education, some it's only two days worth, some it's you know a month worth of talking 20, 50, 100 other people that did it, usually liquidate the 401k and IRA. And I know what you're saying. You can't do it. It can't be done. Well, you're wrong. It can be done. You just have to know how to do it, and we teach people how to do that. The next thing I want to talk about that's a bad idea is paying off your home in full. Um, there's lots of reasons why you don't want to pay off your home in full, but the, the worst reason is the Dave Ramsey reason, which is to say that debt is bad. Debt is not bad. Bad debt is bad. In other words, when you go into debt for credit cards and for lotto tickets and for, you know, food and drugs and stuff like that, man, that mo- that money's gone, and yet you don't have anything to show for it. But when you borrow money to buy assets, and assets return income and grow and wealth, that is not bad debt. That is good debt, if there is such a thing. It's functional debt. It's something that's going to benefit you, Right. But like Dave Ramsey says, I don't want you to get into debt because debt is bad. Why? He says it's bad because he didn't know how to use it. So because he didn't know how to use it and he went bankrupt because of it, he wants you all to not use it. Well, that'd be like me going to my daughter and go, honey, you know, I crashed my car once. Now, you have never even crashed a car, but I have crashed a car once. And so I've deemed that car driving a car is dangerous. So I don't want you to drive a car. What I think you'd be smart to do is stay on a bicycle the rest of your life. If you're If you ride a bicycle the rest of your life, you're never going to have a car crash. Well, a car may crash into you anyway. And the same thing is true if you don't ever go into debt. You may still get hammered by something that has to do with debt. It's just a problem out there that you're trying to solve that isn't really out there. It's a real conundrum. Now, let's go into why you really don't want your house paid in full. Again, to retire, you need cash flow. Does a paid in full house pay you anything? No, it doesn't. 
So let's say that you took that same 400000 you have in your house and put it in an apartment complex and it's paying you 10000 bucks a month. What you need to understand is, is that $10,000 a month would easily pay the mortgage payment on that house that you took the $400,000 out of. So you would have the $400,000 investment, which is growing. You'd have a home, which value might be growing, and you have enough cash flow to cover the debt and still have positive cash flow. That's what you should be doing. You should not be putting all your money into a paid and full house. It just doesn't make any sense. And one last story before I go. If you ever get sued, the one thing they're going to go after is a paid and full house. They're not going to go after a house that's got massive debt on it. There's nothing to go after. If you have your house leveraged to the value of your house, there's nothing for them to sue you for. But if you have $400,000 worth of equity in that house, Every attorney on the street is going to want to take that case and go after you for that money, that equity in the deal. So paid in full house, bad idea. Condo, bad idea. Don't have the time to go into it. Bed and breakfast, bad idea. All these new events, uh, I can go into that one very quickly. Uh, they are being outlawed almost everywhere, but there's other bad ideas. So, sorry I couldn't finish the last couple, but I will get back to them on another day. And for the rest of you, remember this. We're not doing this for some money. We're doing it for a while now. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you tomorrow. The information and opinions you hear on the Del Wamsley Radio Show are those of the host, Del Wamsley, his guests, and his callers. The Del Wamsley Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Del Wamsley Show constitutes an endorsement, recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.